Good morning, everybody. Um, we are about to start now. Can I then request all the participants who have joined via Teams to switch off their mics? And where possible, you can also switch off your video. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SABS launch of the Local Content Scheme. I'm pleased to be here, and today I'm going to be your program director. But I'm not alone. I'm with Katima Temba, who's going to be moderating the next sessions with the panelists. But before we start, there are some administrative aspects that I'd like us to touch on. We are having this dual event during COVID, and therefore we need to observe all the protocols involved. So I'd like to urge all of us to make sure that you sanitize, you wash your hands, you keep your social distance, and, uh, and please make sure that at any given time, unless you're going to be making a speech or participating as a panelist, then you can then take off your mask only at that particular time. The next one is that um, before we start, I would also like to acknowledge the following. Uh, today, we've got our Honorable Deputy Minister, Mr. Figla Majola. Uh, we've got uh, honorable members from the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee responsible for the ministry. We've got uh, TTIC colleagues. One is a panelist, and some of them has, have joined us in terms, uh, as part of the, 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 the teams. We've got uh, our co-administrators, uh, Jody Scholz and Dr. Chenge Dimana. And we've got the SABS team, also led by, led by Jody Scholz. And they've also uh, are present here, some of them. Others have joined uh, via the teams. But ladies and gentlemen, we operate in very challenging times. Macro and micro factors are affecting all of us. And they are affecting the businesses that we operate. And as a result, we, as businesses, we need to continue to strive to evolve. And part of evolving is to make sure that we must remain relevant, we must remain competitive, but we must remain at, and being able to fulfill the particular mandates that each and every organization is, is, is going to do. And with that, I would like to request Jody Scholz to welcome all the panelists and everybody that has joined, including the participants that have joined via and various media platforms. Thanks. Over to you, Jody. Thanks, Nukela. Uh, Deputy Minister uh, of Trade, Industry and Competition, Mr. Fikili Majola, my co-administrator, Dr. Chenge Demana, uh, Dr. Tebojo Makube, Chief Director, I hope I get the title right, Industrial Procurement and Development. Uh, Eustace, a friend of uh, the DTIC family, CEO of Proudly South African, CEO is present. We've got an honored guest, one of SAB's clients, Grant with us this morning. SAB's executives, colleagues, a very good morning to all of you. It's a very exciting day for us today at SABS as DM Majola is officially going to launch a new scheme that has been in development for quite a while. We've met many of you over the course of the last few months, consulting, arguing, agreeing, disagreeing, agreeing to disagree uh, on, on what should go into this, into this scheme. And SABS, as a quality assurer of choice, has been in existence for 75 years. We've developed numerous schemes over this time frame. And we're very proud to be launching this today when localization is a key driving force for government's economic development. SABS is part of the technical infrastructure institutions within South Africa. And the DTIC has called on technical infrastructure institutions to modernize and to support industrialization, equity and growth objectives of government, and be in line with international trends to become independent and most importantly, impartial players. Successful technical infrastructure institution systems requires a relationship between both the private and the public sector, and it also requires the sustainability of our public entities. The DTIC has further cemented this call to action by developing joint key performance indicators intended to strengthen alignment and, more importantly, implementation and service delivery. As SABS, we've answered this call by developing and implementing a turnaround strategy that is focused on ensuring continued relevance to South Africa's dynamic industries. We've spent 19.9 million since the beginning of the year 
on equipment and infrastructure upgrades to ensure that we are able to meet your requirements as our customers and also ensure that we are aligned to government's objectives. We have maintained our license to operate through both RVA and SANUS despite the impact of COVID. We've been able to do this through the introduction of virtual audits and an enhanced auditing process where letters of compliance are issued while testing is in progress, <clears throat> as we understand that the imperative to continue trading while quality assurance processes are concluded. We've also reviewed our operations to ensure improved efficiencies through the introduction of a cust customer partnering arm and a consulting service to enable companies to really understand what it means to conform to quality. Many of you will have been visited by the SABS team, ably led by Lungelo and his team, to understand your requirements and your needs both now and in future, and how we should respond as an institution. We've made several other improvements in our standards development process. We've reduced this to 290 days, down from over 400 in previous years. And this is a real indicator of a more efficient way of working with all of you as the private sector to develop fit for purpose South African national standards. Central to this work is also the need to ensure that our standards respond to gender imperatives. And we've been working really hard to put this in place. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, DM, we've made much achievements, but the road is still long and we continue to ensure that we are both diverse and inclusive in our approach while simultaneously ensuring that we maintain our impartiality. A central focus of the turnaround work going forward is a sustained focus on our labs and ensuring quality testing infrastructure is enhanced. Work is continuing in this space with investments in both hardware and software being made. We've tested syringes and needles as an example to support the national vaccination drive and have initiated partnerships with key industry players to repurpose lab equipment to enhance both the type and the quality of the testing that we provide. Our work in this turnaround strategy would not have been possible without the commitment and dedication of all of our colleagues, our social partners, labor and stakeholders within the Bureau, despite going through a very difficult retrenchment exercise. The support teams that have enabled the work we do are the silent champions who provide us data and the support to continuously improve. We remain committed. Sorry, one arm. To delivering quality conformity assessment services through continuous improvement. And when we may drop the ball occasionally, and it's occasion, it should not be the norm, we ask that you keep us honest by providing us feedback so that we can continuously improve. Having said this about SABS, we've had a, a silent champion throughout this journey and the turnaround strategy. This is a gentleman who has actively participated in many structures during our liberation movement, such as the Vol Youth Congress, the South African Youth Congress, and the United Democratic Front in the Vol in 1983. He is recognized as the longest serving Secretary General of Nihau from 1998 to 2014, and has also served as the Central Executive Committee member of COSATU from 1995 to 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor and the privilege of handing over to Deputy Minister Fikile Majola, who will give us his remarks. Thank you, DM. Over to you. Thank you very much. Program Director, members of the senior government officials, leaders of South African companies who are present, SABS management and the rest of the team, Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very good morning. I want to start by thanking the lead administrator, Ms. Jody Scholes, and her executive management team for working hard in putting together this magnificent event. I also want to convey my greetings to the other co-administrator, Dr. Shenge Dimana, 
Today, for the first time since 2015, the South African Bureau of Standards is launching a new scheme, the Local Content Certification Scheme. The timing of this launch is befitting, particularly as it coincides with a new product designation and a master plan that the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition has recently approved. I'm pleased, ladies and gentlemen, to announce that as of last week, cement is now added to the list of 27 products designated for local content and production in the public procurement system. This is because this government has identified public procurement as a strategic policy instrument to reindustrialize South Africa by making local production mandatory in the procurement of certain goods in public procurement system. We believe this to be important because pragmatically, each time we, whether as government, citizens, businesses, or communities, buy a product which is important, we gift potential jobs, tax revenue, GDP, and our industrial capabilities to our trading competitors. I want to emphasize those last two words trade competitors. No one has ever suggested that we give Ethiopia a goal against Bafana Bafana, or that the Springboks should give the, the All Blacks a try. We compete fiercely, but fail. And by choosing to buy local, we send a powerful message that we have confidence in our local industries, our workers, and our investors. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure that many of us here have family members or friends who have a child or a cousin, a nephew, or a niece who is looking for it. According to Stas SA, there are some 3.3 million young people who are not in employment education or training. We may not see these young people every day, but they are not faceless. The Antandos, Titas, Nokwandas, and Johans. Every time we choose to buy an important product, we deprive these young people of the opportunity to find a job build a career, and contribute to our great nation. Local procurement from government, business and consumers drives production, skills development, and advances our, our industrial capabilities, which in turn creates investment and entrepreneurial opportunities in the domestic economy. It is essential. It is an essential first step in growing businesses, and our economy. Exports are of course important, but most firms start by supplying a domestic market before venturing into exporting. It is the first step that we need to take as a country to ensure that we reverse the economic scarring from the COVID-19 pandemic and get back to addressing the triple challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. This intervention by the SABS is indicative of the commitment and progress we continue to make as government. Localization means that we are able to assist the productive sectors of our economy to continue to manufacture locally, and the more the country moves towards localization, the more decent jobs are created. In August 2021, the South African Reserve Bank forecasted an aggregate, an aggregate real GDP growth rate of 6.1% in South Africa's major trading partners during 2021. 
Key to the improvement in our economic outlook has been the rising export revenues, and this will continue to support our economic growth. We've seen companies and countries that have a strong focus on environmental sustainability and governance, ESG factors, have been able to stand adverse economic market conditions and their performance record has outperformed those who do not focus on ESG. Today, we have all convened here to launch the SABS Local Content Scheme. This scheme is a direct outcome of a focus on ESG as a department with sustainability in the form of localization at the core. I am pleased to inform you that this new scheme is in line with the government's policy statement on localization for jobs and industrial growth. I wish to set out that the launch of this scheme is part of the department's strategic focus based on deeper integration and sustained focus on implementation of our efforts to galvanize inclusive growth and build local industrial capacity. Deeper integration will enhance the connection between our policy vision and effective implementation. Among other things, this new scheme will contribute towards achieving one, uniting growth with transformation boosting local production, and three, growing exports, and four, increasing investment. This scheme is one of the key instruments of the department's program of work for the year ahead, which involves implementing a set of measures covering opportunities that will boost investment levels and build and strengthen export platforms through the AFCFT AFCFTA and other measures. In looking at South Africa's structural problem, we tend to import consumer and capital goods and which still reflects colonial patterns of trade. A comparison between several countries reveals the following levels of imports as a percentage of GDP. UK and EU stands at 12 to 14 percent, Brazil, India, Russia, and China are between 19 and 16 percent, while South Africa stands at 25 percent. We need a combination of several deliberate interventions to reverse this legacy. On the supply side, we need to improve the industrial dynamism of our economy through skills development and a more supporting regulatory environment. Then, on the demand side, we need procurement policies and aggressive marketing, and these would be supported by a range of relevant state incentives and the triple PFA. This is what we mean when we talk about a new model of growth and economic inclusion that unites South Africans and promotes transformation in other ways, inclusive growth. Growth that benefits everyone and not the few. How do we achieve this inclusive growth? Among other things, it is about sharing wealth and opportunity, breaking free from the imbalances of the past, of a society divided between bosses on the one hand and workers and servants. On the other hand, the current proposed amendments to the Companies Act will help to enhance transparency in the salary scale of the highest paid to the least paid worker. If we really are in this together, then our, part, our patterns of ownership, power, and control must be transformed. By building on our successes, we now need to step up policies that actively promote market access and inclusive growth. This scheme will contribute to sustained competitiveness 
of companies and is a vital tool that companies can employ to demonstrate their commitment to localization. The scheme also gives consumers assurance that the products they are buying have been made from locally sourced inputs, thus creating, and more importantly, keeping jobs in South Africa. The, the benefits that will be derived from this scheme are the following. One, there will be proactive verification of all products. Two, this will present opportunities for the procurers of these products to appreciate the levels of local content in their adjudication processes. Three, we'll expedite awarding of tenders with some margin of confidence insofar as local, consent, local content is concerned. Pro four, procurers can set a baseline and drive supplier development programs using this scheme. Of importance, this scheme will also influence and assist policymakers in driving deeper localization agenda and create opportunities to designate in critical areas of our economy. Ladies and gentlemen, I hereby declare the local content scheme open. SABS is ready to assist you. Let us build South Africa together, and I thank you. Give us just uh, some further insights into that uh, later. And what I really liked you saying is that we compete fiercely but fairly. And I think that's that's the role of voluntary compliance. It allows companies through putting uh, quality assurance measure, measures both on the product and on the system side in place. When companies become more competitive, industries become competitive and that enhances country competitiveness. So there's a direct linkage in terms of uh, voluntary compliance and enabling companies to become more competitive and the country as a whole to becoming a lot more competitive. I think the point that you also made about um, imports in South Africa, 25% as, as opposed to other countries ranging from 12% from is, is absolutely critical. And as a country, these are some of the uh, areas that we need to, to address. And this is why uh, we really do believe in this local content um, scheme. Diem, I think the local content verification scheme is also an enabler in terms of looking at regional uh, content verification under the AFCFTA. And the teams at SABS are busy working in various uh, structures on the continent to provide inputs into the Made in Africa standard. These are also um, intended to not only boost South Africa, but boost the region and the continent as a whole. So, Diem, uh, on our side, thank you very much for these inspiring words. I think the focus on sustainability and the whole um, uh, discussion that you've, you've shared with us around ESG um, and, and how localization um, is, is critical to sustainability is also something important that I think myself and the team will take forward. So, um, I think that, Program Director, is my responsibilities for the day. Diem, thank you very much to you and your office. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. I'll hand over to the Program Director. Uh, thanks, thanks, DM, and uh, thanks, Jody. I was going to say that there is a closer say that says you don't repeat what has been said. But unfortunately, if I were to unpack that, it's going to take more than the allocated time. So, colleagues, you will appreciate that you know what is the what now that needs to be done, but also you need to understand how is it supposed to be done. And, uh, and there is no other person other than Mesajo Madondo who can then be able to take us through the mechanics in terms of how does this work. But having said that, those who have connected via Teams, you'll notice that there's a chat box. Please make use of that so that uh, as we go through these presentations, including the panelists, we can then also go through the questions so that then we can take those questions through. Uh, do acknowledge that um, I know that there's going to be a number of questions, but uh, uh, I can safely promise that we will have follow-up engagements that are sector specific in terms of the 40 products that have been designated. And those are also the areas where we can then iron out some of the specific questions that you might have. But having said that, Ms. Sajwa, I don't want to steal your turn again. Come.
thanks, uh, program director. Uh, I'll just say protocol observed uh, and then proceed. Colleagues, uh, my job is very clear, it's very simple. Um, it's just to take you through, particularly the manufacturers, uh, just to take you through the process of uh, verification, just so that you understand exactly how to make to actually achieve the, the best benefits out of the verification process. Uh, colleagues, the, the, the whole verification is structured into, I think, about six slides, if I'm not mistaken, which is taking you through the process and the, the verification stages, and just to apply the, the, some of the key considerations for, if, uh, for, for successful uh, local, local content certification. And to touch on the key final outcome that we present when we talk about the local content scheme. Firstly, the, the, the verification process, <coughs> obviously we mindful of the fact that there's gonna be some form of an application process. We've designed a very simple application process which involves uh, those that will, are willing to get their products certified, uh, completing a simple declaration. We've made it so much simple that it's a, spreadsheet driven you can just populate your figures and it immediately even yourself even before you even um, present your product for verification it even it, it, it helps you calculate your own local content and see exactly where you're sitting in terms of local content verification so the verification process uh, starts off with an application from the manufacturer we then provide them with a declaration form and on receipt of the declaration form we use that declaration form to actually scope the project, which is determining exactly how much time it will take us and how many resources do we need, what type of resources do we need to actually co conduct the verification. Uh, once we've done that, we obviously generate a quotation, which is just a normal uh, commercial pro process that you undertake with our sales team, um, agreeing on the, on, the, on the fee. Then we then dispatch our team to come and do the, the verification. The verification process is, it's a two-driven, two-stream-driven uh, two process. It involves the technical assessments of your production facilities, where our technical auditors would look at your facilities and determine whether your facilities, the actual production is happening in your facilities, whether the, the plant and equipment that you've got at your facilities is actually the right facilities to actually produce the products that you claim to be producing. It also involves the financial auditors who would do a, a financial assessment and do a whole local content cal calculation and eventually determine the level of local content at which you're sitting at. And that gets obviously discussed with you to say this is the final outcome that we've determined and you also get an, an opportunity to actually make your own inputs where, the, where you think it, has been, it hasn't been uh, adequately calculated. You then uh, say, um, share that with, once we've done that, we finalize the whole thing, and we've got an independent structure within the SABS, which we call the approvals board. Once we finalize our work, we then present the final outcome to our approvals board, which assesses whether our processes have been fair and consistent. And on the basis of that, a certification is, is issued based on the grades which we so in, in, in essence, there are three phases, which is the planning phase, the execution phase, and the reporting phases, um, which, as, I, as I've outlined, are actually uh, stated. Just to share with you some of the key principles or key pillars, which, you know, throughout the verification exercise that we've conducted, we've observed that these are the main uh, pillars that would help you as a manufacturer to really make um, make the most benefit or make, make the most out of the verification process. I mean, the first thing, and this is very critical, that you must have a manufacturing plant. If you are a manufacturer or for a product, actually, to, uh, to even be considered for local certification, it must be manufactured in the country. So there must be a manufacturing plant in the country. The manufacturing must be happening locally. So this, that's the second pillar. So in other words, the, the, the products that you are certifying, they must be manufactured in the country. And the third one is that you must be using the local resources, which is your local labor, locally produced uh, input components. And remember, local content is not just you at, as the manufacturer, but it is 
a combination of all the value-add activities that are happening throughout the supply chain. So it's actually important that you buy from locally manufacturers. So in, 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 your, in, your, in your supply chain, use local manufacturers to actually source the input components that you're using. Uh, buying from a local supply in itself doesn't, make, doesn't necessarily give you local content if that supplier is actually importing those, those components. The third one is that uh, obviously you use your local labor. And the fourth one we normally say it's the replication. Remember, local content for it to be effectively achieved, you really have to collaborate with your, all, your, all your stakeholders in your supply chain. So you get your suppliers to actually start producing locally and get them to repeat the four steps that I've mentioned above. So if they do that, they give you inputs that are of high local content value, and that contributes to a higher local content value in, at your level. And obviously, you need to look at the targeted grades that you're looking at, which, what are the grades that you're targeting. We've made a simple um, formula to calculate local content, which is A equals to B minus C divided by B multiplied by 100, where A refers to the local content, B is the selling price, obviously excluding your markups and your indirect overheads. So we're looking at the actual production costs to actually calculate local content. And your C is actually the imported content. So if you take out the imported content and we, the value of A, yeah, the value of B, you take out all the indirect materials into the, out, of, out of the production process, that gives you uh, the, the, press, the, press, the process to actually calculate a local content. We've determined a 10 grading, a 10 tier grading system, which starts from A to J. There were quite a number of arguments whether we really need to look at J, you know, but we thought, look, um, just for people to be able to even um, make informed decisions about what to do to actually improve uh, 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 improve their grades. We thought we should rather allow even the J uh, section, uh, J level to be there. So A being a 90 to 100 and the B 81 to 90, uh, 80 to 90, 80 to 89. So we put all those things. So when we do the verification, we then determine at which level you fall in and based on the level that you're falling in, we will then record your product as a grade D, B, C, or whatever the case it is. It certainly helps. I mean, the deputy minister was talking about the, the, this being a tool to actually drive um, industrial developments in the country. If we're verifying products and they're all sitting at that range of about J and H, those are areas of improvement if we, if we could think about. Those are areas where we could concentrate on because that and that's an indication that there's high concentration of uh, imported materials used in those products. So if we really are to drive industrialization, is to look at those and see how best can we help those guys that are sitting at that level to actually move up the grades and get better grades. Uh, we've, the scheme that, we've develop, that we're developing um, is we've looked at our normal certification scheme at, at the SABS is actually a three-year uh, scheme, but we've decided that we are going to run a five-year scheme for this, and it's, it's purely based on the fact that you know we and we mindful of the fact that the cost that we that the local local content verification puts on should not be a, a burden on the supply on the manufacturers. So we've put up a five-year scheme as opposed to a three-year scheme. You know, it means that in the first year you get a full-blown verification where we determine the levels of local content, the local the levels of local content that your products are sitting at, and then over the periods that is between the, the from year from year two to year five, what we do is what we call the surveillance verification. Surveillance verification will certainly differ based on all the activities that you've undertaken throughout the year. So we may look at what are the technical technical adjustments that you've done in your production processes, what are technological improvements that you've put on, the, on, your, on, your, on, your, on, your, on your production processes, and we may zoom in the, on those particular areas and just to ensure that, you know, that we, the, the local content percentage that which you certified 
is actually uh, constant and correct. Um, and then that allows us to actually spread the cost of the verification process throughout a five-year period. Ladies and gentlemen, that would be my end of my story. Thank you. Um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SAVS launch for the um, local content grading scheme. I have a simple duty to, to perform today. I'm joined with um, panelists uh, in our midst. I must say that uh, the purpose of this launch, among other things, is to disseminate information to all users of products in the country. <clears throat> the scheme is intended for uh, public uh, entities, inclusive of uh, private entities. And this is purely to drive the localization agenda the Deputy Minister has spoken to. Before I get to, to the task of the day, I have a simple duty to do just to introduce the panelists. So I'll start with um, introducing here Dr. Makube. Among many roles, Dr. Makube has been a program manager, fiscal policy at Financial Fiscal Commission, FFC, FFC, and director of professional infrastructure at National Treasury, and also held a position, research manager position in Gauteng Provincial Legislature, including NARSA and Nokusa Consulting. He's currently a board member for Proudly South Africa and Trade Industrial Policy Strategies, TIPS. Dr. Makube holds a PhD in Energy Studies and other postgraduate qualifications in Law, Economic Policy, and Energy Economics. Welcome, Dr. Makube. Thank you. So clearly you can see, you can hear, ladies and gentlemen, I've set the bar. There's a lot to expect in this conversation. Joined with us is the CEO of Proudly South Africa, Mr. Eustace Mashimbe, a qualified financial accountant, I, when I was reading this, I see uh, technical northern Houting brings nostalgia to me. <laughs> I could relate with the entity I've been there, the institution rather. Among others, also uh, studied at UNISA, majored in financial accounting and corporate law, currently studying towards his MBA uh, with the Management College of South Africa. Currently pursuing his governance qualification uh, through Chartered Secretaries Institute. Mr. Mashimbe has served as a board member of Business Place and also director on the board of South African Savings Institute. He has played many roles in Proudly SA as a CFO, acting CEO, acting CEO, permanently appointed as a CEO in 2016. Welcome, Mr. Mashimbe. Also, uh, in our midst, we have um, one of our clients, Mr. Um, Grant Fandasi from Multitech is a supply chain executive at Multitech and is responsible for procurement and logistics across the group. Grant also heads the transformation committee responsible for matters relating to triple BE. Holds the BCom and MBA has covered over 20 years experience in supply chain. Last but not least, my colleague, Dr. Sadvir Bissoun. Uh, I can, if I were to read his profile, it will take me two days, colleagues. <laughs> this is how loaded this gentleman is. But the least to say is Dr. Bassoon is the current council member for International Organization for Standardization, ISO. He's also a council member for Africa Regional Standard Organization, ARSO, in the continent. Council member of African Electrotechnical Commission, AFSEC. Uh, just to list a few, Dr. Besson uh, has a DTEC technology in biotechnology from the University of um, KZN. Welcome, Dr. Besson. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've heard from the speech of the Deputy Minister and our lead administrator, Ms. Uh, Jody Swells, <coughs> on the importance of transformation. Dr. Makube, I'll start with you. The Deputy Minister's speech has outlined how the scheme supports a broader localization drive of government. Can you share with us the opportunities and challenges you have come across in the implementation of local content verification in the public procurement space? Um, Program Director, good 
money, uh, including the administrators, uh, uh, Ms. Jody Scholes uh, and Dr. Cheng, and not forgetting um, our minister or deputy minister, Majon. Um, all protocol observed. Uh, we, as government, we started with the local content um, verification program in 2012. It was launched formally by the former um, Minister of Trade and Industry, Dr. Rob Davis. Uh, this is after the preferential procurement regulations were amended in 2011 giving government powers to designate uh, certain products for local content and, and, and production. So therefore there was a need for the verification of products which are manufactured in, in South Africa. So since then, we have had both challenges and opportunities up um, till today what we are doing, which for me it's reforming the verification uh, process given what we have learned over uh, the years. In terms of the, the, the challenges, um, I think the challenges are embedded in, in the procurement system um, of, of, of government in the main because the verification um, of local content is applicable in the public sector. And as we know, um, public procurement is a challenge in, in South Africa. So local content being an instrument of public procurement find itself also, you know, in such challenges. And one issue is about organs of state, including local content uh, requirements in, in, in some of the genders. It's still a challenge uh, now. Um, some are not including those conditions. And it's mainly because public procurement is devolved in South Africa. We have, on average, more than 2,000 um, government departments, including state-owned companies, procuring. So you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Uh, the understanding of mm -hmm. what is being required. Mm -hmm. um, so that is on the government side. So that is a structural challenge we are having. <clears throat> on the on the on the bidder side, um, there are bidders who are manufacturers and non-manufacturers. So in terms of the public procurement law or the triple PFA, anyone who um, is not precluded from participating in government tenders can participate. It's not only manufacturers. So in this case, you find that there are non-manufacturing bidders who are sending bids in and they don't understand sometimes the, the requirements in terms of the products that which are designated. So we do provide uh, training to the procuring organs of state, including PETA, so that they understand the, the, the requirements. But those are challenging. Some bidders, obviously, because they know the, the, the requirements up front, and they understand that if they don't meet the requirements, they're they not going to win the tender. So they misdeclare, which it's, it's forgery and sometimes it's criminal. All right. So we it's not an issue that you can resolve through a civilian program of verification. So it, it, it's, it's, therefore, that's the challenge. Um, opportunities, there are opportunities. So the scheme itself, for me, is an opportunity, and I applaud what uh, the South African Bureau of Standards has done to invite companies who we are honestly manufacturing in the country to come in and take advantage of accreditation you know, before the tender. 
So I, I encourage companies to come in. But also for non-manufacturing builders to educate themselves as to what is being required. There is no law precluding them from tendering uh, on, on designated products. So improve your knowledge, take advantage of this. Other opportunities, I think the public procurement bill, which the National Treasury is, is working on, uh, uh, in consultation with other government departments, including the DTIC, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to provide certainty. Remember, the, the current framework is that uh, local content verification is not legislated. All right? So it's a, it's a policy decision. Now, there are challenges in the absence of, of a legislative requirement for this function. So the bill will provide an opportunity in terms of, of transparency, certainty, uh, and, and, and also you know, giving strength to compliance, you know, because that's an issue we are sitting with uh, now. You know, so if, if institutions like the SAPS is given uh, powers to provide an opinion uh, and also recommend for the cancellation of tenders on the basis that they don't comply to local content uh, verification. For me, that is it, it, it's required and the bill is critical. There are other uh, opportunities moving forward. I think the next phase, you must look at how we automate the, the, the local content verification system so that bidders who are located uh, not in Gauteng, but all over the country don't have to come here uh, and phone you, but they can go online uh, to you know, lodge maybe queries and, and do the application. So that, that for me is it's, it's, uh, it's an opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Makube. Uh, for that insightful uh, comments on the opportunities and uh, challenges. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have adopted a hybrid type of engagement uh, in this uh, sitting. But I want to pose my question, and uh, I think my colleague he is more into technology than me, CEO of Proudly Asini. But can you share with us the role of uh, Proudly Asini? Uh, in localization. Okay. Over to you, Mr. Mashir. All right. Thank you very much. Good morning uh, to the Deputy Minister, to the lead administrator, the co administrator, and to our fellow panelists and everyone who joined us this morning, uh, all protocol observed. Uh, I'm going to take you through a few slides just to unpack the role, and I'll be very brief. I've been asked to be brief. I know I do take time, uh, usually, when I unpack the role of policy healthcare. But what we are is a bi-local campaign, and uh, I thought in unpacking the role of Paris African is better to give a sense of what happens all over the world uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, utilizing localization as a, a lever for growing economies. It's a global phenomenon, and as you can see on the slides, it's uh, one that uh, is utilized, especially in developed economies, where you even have bi-local campaigns for towns, for regions, for countries. So it's not just something that we have adopted without necessarily having done the studies to determine whether it works or not. It's tried and tested all, all over the world. And we are seeing a lot of African countries adopting it in their quest to grow their own economies. In fact, the case study that uh, I've chosen to utilize uh, for this session in the interest of time was the United States, where as far back as 1933, they even came up with legislation known as the Buy American Act. Uh, that act was followed up by other acts uh, known as the Biomedica Act, as well as the Biomedica Improvement Act in 2017. So it's not unique to South Africa. Uh, developed economies like uh, the US have adopted it. In fact, when the current president, Biden, came into office, he signed into uh, power executive orders within the first week of coming into office, uh, strengthening Biomedican provisions so that the federal government, whenever they make uh, purchasing decisions, they prioritized localization. He even addressed the Senate and Congress back in April uh, in a session where he focused on localization. So it is uh, a global phenomenon, and in, in, in our context, 
what we have is probably South African whose mandate is to ensure that anyone who makes purchasing decisions, whether for the private sector or whether in the public sector or as ordinary consumers, they choose locally made products. We have four focus areas. And uh, what we focus on is um, firstly to support the public <coughs> sector in enforcing legislation that they put in place that seeks to ensure that uh, whenever they make purchasing decisions uh, in favor of, of, of or when buying designated items, they buy those items locally. And Dr. Makube touched on that. We have to get the private sector to also contribute to the growth of the economy by buying local. We continue to educate the public on the economic importance and the impact of buying locally made products. But most importantly, uh, we have to ensure that those who want to make purchasing decisions know where to find the products. And so the fourth pillar of the work we do is to promote accessibility of locally made products and services. And, and so that is what we focus on uh, as Pilots of Ken. And uh, uh, every time you come across a product that carries the Pilots of Ken logo, and that's why I chose to use slides so that I can remind people who Pilots of Ken is. When you look at the logo that you see on the screen, you will see that it's made up of the colors of the flag of the Republic of South Africa. So it tells you that the product itself contains the local content, uh, that the product is locally made, utilizing local resource inputs, that the product is of a high quality nature, and that in the course of manufacturing the product, the companies themselves adhere to sound environmental practices and they comply with the labor legislation of the country. Uh, and in terms of the work we do in the public sector, we support uh, the, the attainment of those goals by ensuring that we contribute to the, the driving up of compliance in that space. And what we have done is we have packaged a, a, a service of roadshows. Uh, so those are designated items, but maybe we can move on from that. There's 27, or I know that there's 28 now with cement having been added. But what we have done, which is part of the work that we do with uh, SABS, is we've carried out the uh, roadshows where we go into the public sector, and, and it touches on what Dr. Makube mentioned where we have to engage public sector officials that are meant to implement these uh, local content regulations. We educate them, we expose them to, to possible solutions that are at their disposal, including this local content verification scheme that is going to assist them uh, when, when carrying out their duties and complying with, with the labor legislation of the, uh, with the legislation, uh, the local content regulations that are in place. We, we also have implemented a tender monitoring system that helps us track tenders for all designated items. So the 27 plus one now, 28 items that are designated, uh, have, all have keywords linked to them. So what we've done with the system is we've taken those keywords and put them onto a system that allows us to pick up the tenders every time anyone in government uh, or in the public sector advertises a tender for any of those uh, designated items. This helps us intervene when the tender is issued because when the tender is issued, we can immediately pick it up and send it to the DTIC. In fact, Dr. Makube's team uh, assist us in this regard. They are meant to uh, engage with the procuring entity once they've gone through the tender uh, to ensure that in instances where the tenders themselves don't have those provisions that will exclude importers from participating, that they correct those tenders. We also then have an opportunity to then send those tenders to all uh, local producers who can then bid for, for the opportunity so that we don't end up with tenders that are non-responsive because none of the local producers that are eligible for bidding for those opportunities can, can participate. And so that is the role of Pilot South Ken in terms of um, what our mandate is and what we are doing in this space. I think the tender monitoring system gives us an opportunity uh, to provide support to uh, the public sector in ensuring that uh, when tenders are issued from the get-go, the tenders are compliant, especially in so far as uh, tenders for designated items are, con are concerned. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, uh, Eustace. Uh, one of the issues you touched on is the appetite that is growing in the continent when some member states uh, have expressed interest in, in, in following the route uh, probably as a has taken. I think that takes me to Dr. Bisson. Uh, with that understanding, uh, can you give us an overview of the importance of regional standardization in support of uh, AFCFTA? The Deputy Minister also touched on the AFCFTA, uh, particularly from, from your perspective, please. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director, Honorable Deputy Minister. 
um, Ms. Jody Skoltz, Lead Administrator. Um, it's certainly a great pleasure to be participating uh, in this forum. Just to talk a bit about the African continental free trade area as an introductory statement, I would just like to say that the continental free trade area has been signed by 55, 54 member states and it has been ratified of recently by 38 member countries. So it's a substantial achievement and uh, this achievement allows for the implementation of uh, the industrialization ambitions of um, the various member states and ensuring that this allows for an enhanced intra-Africa trade. There's two very important aspects um, that is part of the African continental free trade area, which are the Annex 5, which talks specifically to Article 6 and Article 8. Article 6 refers to the standardization bodies and the importance of regional standards. And Article 8 talks to the conformity assessment systems and how we manage conformity assessments in terms of the efficient movements of goods and services into the African continent. SABS is a um, founding member of ARSO. ARSO is the regional body in, uh, in Africa and their responsibility is to develop harmonized African regional standards. There's the membership of 39 member bodies actively participating in ARSO regional standardization technical committees and influencing and developing one unified, consistent African regional standard. And that is for implementation by the various member countries. So this is the ambition regarding a technical infrastructure perspective, especially with the harmonization of standards in influencing and supporting the, the uh, African continental free trade area. Second to that is around the conformity assessments. So it's one thing having a standard, but more importantly, it's important to have a conformity assessment regime attached to that as well. So the mutual recognition of conformity assessment services within the African continent and the member states is one of the aspects that need to be implemented. Um, and this will certainly drive a higher uh, enthusiasm uh, and a higher application of quality and quality assurance services in terms of uh, products that are going to be moved much more efficiently and enhanced in the African continent. I would like to also touch on uh, a few areas of priorities which uh, ARSO has put together in terms of harmonization of standards. It includes a few, which is agriculture, agro-processing, uh, the tourism industry, the mining area, manufacturing sectors, uh, areas like the chemicals industry, um, uh, the textiles, footwear, and a number of these also align to our industrial priority sectors as implemented by the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. Lastly, um, there's a very important initiative that is being driven by, by ARSO um, hmm? at central office. To the concept or program referred to as Made in Africa. This program provides a specification on what are the requirements for Made in Africa as well as an implementation guideline. And it speaks to one in one, the other aspect of the African continental free trade area, which is uh, the rules of origin. So it complements the rules of origin document that has been put forward. Um, so the Made in Africa standard is a critical standard that is going to enhance the aspect of localization within the African country community. And uh, we're looking forward to that. It's, it's, it's an area of, uh, um, that is expanding in the sense of maturity of that document. It hasn't been concluded. It's still in the draft stage, but there's going to be a significant amount of consultation to finalize that document, um, which is the local content aspect um, of the African continent. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you, um, Dr. Bassoon. We've spoken at the beginning, we started with the policy maker, Dr. Makube. We went to our sister uh, organization, Proudly SA. My colleague just spoken from SABS. So you cannot only government, only talking. As we're launching the scheme today, we also need to hear from one of our clients. 
Today at our midst, we have uh, Mr. Grant Fandasi from Multitech. Uh, Mr. Fandasi, as a, one of our first companies to receive local content certificate, since you're supplying a lot of your products in the mining sector, can you share with us your experience in preparing for SABS local content verification audit? Program Director, Administrator, Deputy Minister, good morning, colleagues, fellow panelists. On well, behalf of Multitech, thank, thank you so much for having me here to represent our organization. Yes, Katima, um, preparation for the local content process. Um, if I think back to what we did at Multitech, there were a host of things we did in order to prepare for our verification process. But to keep it concise, I'd highlight two major reasons or factors for what we believe to be um, the reason for successful uh, verification process. The first one, because Multitech was going to do its local content verification across the entire group of companies, but all the companies, all the business units, quite a complex organization. We realized that absolutely critical would be to have a focused approach. We then made a decision to form a dedicated project team and we handled the verification process as a project. We appointed a project manager. We appointed a liaison with the SABS. We appointed a procurement lead for all our suppliers, our tier two and three suppliers for coordination with them. Last but not least, we also appointed a commercial manager. Someone, uh, he, he was a, 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 a CA, and he also has excellent skills in interrogating the group's ERP. So in other words, the ability to uh, extract information, liaise with other financial colleagues across the business. And then that project team reported to the then chief operating officer. So he kept a very, very uh, short leash on us to make sure that this pro project doesn't fail. So I think that was the first thing. There was a dedicated focus team to handle the, the, the con local content process, uh, uh, Katima. Otherwise, it just becomes part of someone's job and it would not necessarily get the attention it deserved. So I think we did that incredibly well and incredibly uh, quickly. The second thing we did is when we looked across the product range across multiple, it was, it was like a mountain staring at us. To get through thousands and thousands of products, it would be insurmountable. We also knew that not all our products in the mining space would meet a 60% threshold. So therefore we set about to identify the products that we believe would make the threshold. So through our project team, we identified those products and those were the only ones we then put forward to the SABS to be verified for local content. The benefit of that was that number one, it reduced the amount of time that the verification team, both the financial team and the technical auditor, I think this after the presentation showed the process that we followed, didn't require as much time to complete or to conduct the verification. And as a consequence, the cost of the verification was significantly reduced. So by doing quite a bit of the groundwork upfront ourselves, we reduced the number of products. That in itself also gave us another opportunity. The products that did not meet the 60% threshold, they've been clearly identified. And as we speak, we are interrogating those products, the supply chains of those products, to see how we can make changes so that when we do have uh, another verification, when that time comes, those products are able to meet the 60% threshold. So, um, I think preparation absolutely key. The two key takeaways was the formation of a dedicated team to tackle the project 
and then also do the groundwork yourself. Don't call the SABS in and just, you know, they, it's, it's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. So take ownership and understand the nature of your products. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. The Tamaku, we're coming back to you. As you're talking about opportunities and challenges, I think you flagged a number of issues, interventions that um, uh, you've been involved together with your directorate, you touched on issues of training, what opportunities are there in terms of the scheme, and, and what lies ahead from a bill perspective, including some elements you touched on on automation. But I just want to get a sense from yourself as to how do you see the evolution of local content verification uh, in the short term to medium term? Well, the, the focus currently uh, has been on, on the public sector um, procurement system. Uh, there are opportunities to expand the verification framework, uh, mining, um, it's an opportunity. So the local content and procurement in in the mining space, um, those are very critical uh, because as a country we spend uh, billions, you know, far more than 50 billion rands yeah, importing uh, capital equipment in the mining space. So um, as as part of the um, local procurement in mining, um, the emphasis is to reduce that import bill. So the, therefore verification is going to be critical in that space. Uh, the other opportunity, you know, um, others view COVID as, as a crisis, and it is a crisis, but it's also an opportunity to localize uh, medical supplies in, in, in South Africa, including um, the PPE. So some of the products we're importing, but since um, the COVID uh, hit us, we have been able to put um, the public sector, private sector, labor organization together to look at uh, the manufacturing of those uh, products. So there, there are opportunities in, 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 in for us to medical to localize medical supplies and also there what is critical is the role of private uh, medical care you know which must also um, procure local um, a manufacturer does not manufacture only for the public sector you manufacture a product and what do you expect is that the product must be consumed in the country and for export so aggregate demand is key so um, there are opportunities to sell the skin in 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 the uh, private medical care. Uh, private South African is here to assist that. So let's have a dialogue in that because we we want to see companies buying um, um, medical uh, products. Also, as government, we are working on the barrett of. Uh, master plants, you know, the, the agro, the poultry, um, see. Um, so as part of the government economic restructure and, and recovery plan, you know, infrastructure is going to need. So we are going to buy a lot of, of, of construction material. Uh, so an addition of cement is an indication of what we are planning to do in making sure that we don't import uh, most of the products through our infrastructure investment, but um, uh, by locally manufactured uh, building material. So that's an opportunity also to expand this uh, verification scheme. So it will require a coordination work, closer working relationship with uh, private South African industry and labor, because labor is also critical, you know. Uh, Ultimately, what we want to do is to create job opportunities, you know, and the economy must work for the people of this country. We know that unemployment is a problem uh, in South Africa. It creates a lot of social aids. So if we are able to put this uh, support 
local manufacturing, I think they will be able to deal with quite a number of economic benefits and, and associated multipliers. So this is critical for, for South Africa and the economy. Correct. Thank you, Dr. Makube. Building on this evolution, uh, Eustace, Mr. Mashimu, what are your views about the enforcement of local content? And what can be done to ensure that government procuring entities are included and adhere to local content requirements? We have seen uh, since the introduction of designations uh, close to a decade or so ago uh, that the levels of compliance within the procuring entities continue to gradually grow up, but they're still not where they need to be. Ideally, you want everybody to comply. You want 100% compliant. It's legislated. There are rules in place. It's clear which items are designated and what you want is that anyone who buys those items should buy locally made products. And so the challenge is to ensure that procuring entities buy as expected uh, when they buy designated items. In fact, uh, in, the leg in the regulations, there's, there are even provisions that say the procuring entity itself can self-designate even when an item that they want to buy is not necessarily designated, they can choose uh, to procure it as if it were designated. And so one of the challenges that the procuring entities are going to always have and that they've always had is reliance on the self-declaration that is made by the bidding entity. And so this presents an opportunity for them to have an additional tool that they can rely on. They know that if you come and you bid and you have that... Uh, your certification that confirms that you've gone through the local content verification scheme with SABS and your category. I mean, Mesetra showed us the different categories. And depending on the thresholds that are prescribed for each item that is designated, if you're buying clothing and textiles, which is designated at 100%, we expect that your certification should be category A because then you have 100%. So I think that will make it easy. Uh, for for those who evaluate the tenders, those who adjudicate over the work that has been done by the bid evaluation committees to determine whether the, the preferred entities will be uh, suitable, will be fully compliant, uh, because we are getting a sense that because of the self-declaration, there are entities that declare that they are going to supply locally made products at the time when they are bidding, when they receive the order, they go and they buy elsewhere. I mean, the, the, the items supplied to the state that are not necessarily made locally when the bidding entity had undertaken to supply locally made products. So, so I, I think those leakages uh, will now be dealt with adequately through this local content verification scheme. And I think that's the biggest opportunity that we see with this scheme being launched. And that's why we, we fully support it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Bissoum, you touched on Made in Africa and Will you be able to expand for us, uh, the initiatives that are embedded in uh, and what is it that it seeks to achieve? Uh, thank you, uh, Program Director. So, just want to go back um, on the one aspect regarding the African continental free trade area and, and the other organization which plays a very significant role as well uh, in the implementation, which is AFSEC, which is the African Electro Technical Commission. Um, and uh, this body together has the same objectives as also in terms of ensuring that we have harmonization of, uh, of standards within the continent. The AFSEC is specifically responsible for harmonization of standards in the electric technical sector. The overall ambition of all these harmonization activities together with these um, regional organizations is to ensure that we have one standard, harmonized standard, which will result in one test report and will result in one certificate. And that basically is the efficiency of movements and provision of services within the African continent. Coming now to the Made in Africa, um, the, the standard itself or the document that has been put forward as a draft document, it is an incentive framework and basically is responsible for the promotion of the production, manufacture of goods and the provision of services um, within the continent um, and, and it allows for an element of benefit in terms of preferential um, agreements within the ambit of the African continental 
free trade area. There's a number of initiatives that are within the document itself, and it's a quite a comprehensive document that needs to be really unpacked uh, quite comprehensively. But the objectives are to ensure that we enhance industrialization. That is the primary key fundamental objective, enhance industrialization in the, um, in the continent. Um, this will result in the promotion of a diverse export opportunities. To the DM's point as well in the morning, uh, which was through his address in terms of resource orientated um, a region. That needs to be transformed through industrialization to uh, provide secondary and, and enhance and mature secondary and tertiary uh, um, sectors. Uh, and that is, again, another very important point that needs to be taken into consideration. It also highlights issues around intellectual property regarding brands, um, regarding um, um, copyright issues around documents, etc., and a wide variety of other intellectual property discussions that need to take place as well. But underpinning everything is about creating a regional value chain of products and services um, that will certainly allow for a greater uh, percentage. Currently, it's probably sitting around, you know, at the very lower two-digit percentage points on intra-Africa trade. That needs to be expanded um, expand, uh, um, significantly over the coming years in terms of the, the vision of the tree, free uh, trade area. So the objective is also to provide this incentive to identify products that are made in Africa, wholly made in Africa, typically homegrown products. And that's on one hand. On the other hand, it is about looking at substantial transformation of products and components. It might come in as a raw material from another country outside of the African continent, but how substantive have we transformed that product and take that into consideration around made in Africa criteria to allow that product to now be designated as a made in Africa product. There is an element of um, certification or authentication as well that comes in as part of the document. So the guideline allows for an audited process as well. It can be a self-declarated pro declaration process, and it also provides capacity for a certification process uh, on the made in Africa um, supplemented on the Made in Africa um, initiative, supplemented by logos, certification schemes, and this entire process is going to be uh, endorsed and managed by the um, ARSO, which is the African Regional Standards Organization. So, um, Program Director, I think that's a, a bit of a feedback regarding the current status of the Made in Africa uh, document as well. There's a lot that needs to unfold in terms of uh, finally addressing and, and concluding and endorsing this, this document as part of the various government departments. And uh, I think uh, we'll be working very closely with the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition and the various stakeholders as well, uh, contributing to finalizing this document, including um, uh, finalizing the various criteria. As I understand, a lot of input has been uh, put together and submitted as part of the consultation process uh, in the, on this document. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dr. Bissoun. So, Grant, um, since local content verification also includes your suppliers, be it tier one or tier two of your input materials, can you share with us how have you managed to collaborate with them in ensuring a successful verification? Yes, um, program director. Um, I mentioned earlier yeah, that. that we had done quite a bit of the groundwork to identify which of our products we believe would meet the 60% local content threshold. So having done that piece of work, it was quite easy to identify the suppliers who would form part of the local content verification process. We then identified all the way down to tier three, not knowing who the auditors would want to engage with. Having identified all the suppliers down to tier three, we invited them and hosted a supplier information day. Because not all, all our suppliers are as sophisticated perhaps as Multitech is, or perhaps not as knowledgeable about what local content was at that time. So we took it upon ourselves to share information with our suppliers, to inform them what local content, what, what, it, what it was all about, to tell them why it was important to Maltotech and why it was important for us that they 
participate in this process. Included in the um, supplier events, we had Misatwa and his team from the invitation. So they were present also, you know, spreading the gospel of local content. Again, just reinforcing, reinforcing the message of what this is, why it's important, why it's necessary. And the engagement was incredibly good. Um, we had very good Q, uh, Q and A sessions at the end, and there were two key themes, program director, that kept on popping up. The one, oh, both of them were concerns from the supplier perspective. The one was around cost, the cost of this verification process, and the second one was um, was around confidentiality. So of course we were able to address the issue around cost quite easily because Multitech being the entity being verified, the cost is for our account, so we put their minds at ease that uh, there's no cost for the further tiers of supply. And with regards to confidentiality, we gave them the assurance that all the information that they would share with the SABS would be confidential. In other words, they would not submit anything to Multitech. All Multitech was responsible for would be the introduction of the supplier to the um, SABS uh, auditing team. All the information, everything that is shared between them remains there, and uh, that was addressed through NDAs. And um, in that way, we managed to get our suppliers on board, because without our suppliers on board, the local content verification process would be an absolute waste of time. And we're very fortunate in that um, they did not let us down. Thanks, Grant. I'm aware that I'm running out of time because we also want to take the, the questions from uh, our viewers there who are not with us in the building. But I just want to squeeze two questions quickly. Uh, to you, Eustace, um, how do you, what are the opportunities you see uh, Proudly South Africa collaborating with SABS insofar as local content is concerned? And the biggest opportunity outside of the, the public sector procurement space that I'm seeing uh, is in terms of the work we're doing in the private sector, where we are continuously soliciting local local procurement and localization commitments, where we're asking the private sector to also start contributing. We have even come up with a portal known as the Market Access Portal, which is a matchmaking tool where as uh, private sector corporates, you are able to go on to the platform and find uh, localization suppliers or localized suppliers that you can buy from. The biggest question that keeps pop, pop, pop coming up every time we engage with the private sector is can they trust that the products are indeed locally made? Uh, and obviously the, the reliance at this point in time is on our own vetting process where we vet uh, up to at least 50%. Uh, and Dr. Pursun mentioned the fact that even where the raw materials come from outside of South Africa, what we look for when we vet our members is the transformation must happen within the borders of South Africa. So that is the only reliance now. So the addition of these to that pot uh, will, will, will really make a big difference because if you go on as a corporate onto the portal and let's say you're looking for someone to supply you with transformers and you say, you click on transformers, it will give you a list of all those companies. Those that have been vetted will have the Proudly SA logo. So I think the opportunity is now to add the SABS logo for those that have now, uh, that will have now gone through the local content verification process with SABS. It now tells you, it tells Grant as a procurement person that you can trust this company in terms of the levels of local content that uh, they, they are declaring to you because someone else has looked at it. And, and I think that's the biggest opportunity is to now take it beyond uh, the, just the public sector procurement space mm -hmm. into the private sector procurement work that we've undertaken in collaboration with mm -hmm. uh, organized business, with BUSA specifically. So I see that as the biggest opportunity uh, outside of the public procurement space. Good. Thanks, Eustace. Um, Dr. Makuwe, just final question for you. I'd just like you to expand uh, on some of the challenges that you think um, you this scheme Actually, what the scheme is going to alleviate in your own perspective, the scheme that we're launching today, among other things that you've spoken to. 
what do you see as some of those things that the scheme is going to alleviate further over and above what you've given us? Um, the opportunity, obviously, the way we are applying the, the current uh, framework is the uh, post tender award verification, which it's a problem, you know, because by the time you go and visit companies, contracts have been signed. And in certain instances, you find that uh, uh, supplies have been made, you know, uh, and it creates a problem. So this changes that framework, kind of a pre-verification uh, scheme. So it's an opportunity for companies out there to come and contact you to be pre-verified, you know, whether they're supplying into the public sector or not. Um, they can be uh, verified. There's an opportunity to export into the African market and other regions. So if they, they, they are verified, that will also, you know, carry some weight, you know, given the, the opportunities being created by Africa Free Continental Trade Area. You know, so don't wait for, for, for orders to be made and you want to then come and visit you. The, the challenge for me is how do we deal with uh, non-manufacturing bidders, All right? Uh, because they are tendering and they'll have to comply to the rules of verification. So we have to think uh, properly as to how we, we, we deal with them. We don't want uh, uh, bidders who are not manufacturing saying that we have created a barrier to entry, you know. Um, a verification scheme broadly should be about assisting entrepreneurs to participate in the opportunities being created by the government through the procurement system. So they are also welcome. Um, there is no limitation for people who are not manufacturing to participate. The condition is that the product itself must be manufactured in South Africa. You know, so we some roadshows, provinces, mm -hmm. it's going to be critical to metros and so forth. Um, I know that probably South African is having a program to meet with, um, with, with provinces, municipalities. I think we can jointly have that so that we, we sell. This is good for, for the economy, it's good for growth in this country, it's good for employment. So the, the benefits uh, are far greater than the cost. So it's a, it's a good thing. Great. So, so gentlemen, I'm coming to the end of the session. I know as you're sitting there, you're probably thinking I should have said this and that. Uh, I'll give you the 30 seconds each to round off your remarks. Over to you, Dr. Bissin. Thank you, Program Director, and thank you for the uh, very um, enlightening discussion around uh, local content procurement, both at the national and, and regional level. Um, a few take-home messages from, from my side. I think there's an element of discussion of, of enforcement and how this becomes um, um, influential in pushing forward the agenda around the appetite for local content verification. So there needs we need to have some sort of discussion around that. Digitization is, is something that needs to be an enabler. We need to have smart, efficient processes to make sure that uh, we cut down all the bureaucracy, red tape uh, that, uh, that uh, small businesses require to make sure that uh, they enter the market as well. Um, collaboration. Uh, I think collaboration, collaboration, collaboration uh, is key. And this is not just pub, uh, pri public sector entities, it's public and private sector entities. We have a lot to learn. We have a lot of, we don't, might not have the experiences of what the uh, uh, private sector is in, encountering in the marketplace. And that's why we need to have this collaborative platform and co-create solutions to make sure it's efficient uh, implementation of local content verification in the marketplace. And I think promotion and capacity building is another element, especially for the small, medium, micro enterprises where the, we might have tools, et cetera, but it's the how. How do we assist you uh, build some level of capacity to efficiently manage local content verification as a process.
Thanks, program director. Thank you, Grant. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I think just in closing, while the local content beautification process has been, from multiple perspectives, very valuable, very useful, and we continue to support it, um, it's not all perfect. Um, and I don't believe everything that, that we have concerns with uh, lies in the space of the SDS um, being supplies into the mining industry. Um, one of one of the key concerns is the absence or lack of one single codifying system. Um, you know, and linked to that is at what level will verification take place going forward? So in the absence of, as an example, uh, SANS 1286 or something like that, at what level will it happen? At individual product level, at family uh, group level, um, because the implications there could be quite significant. Um, if you think about verification at item level and standardizing that across the industry, my word, what a monster. And I know a piece of work was uh, initiated uh, previously. Um, perhaps it's uh, bubbling along in the background, but you know, from from the mining perspective, we really need to have some clarity to understand, um, you know, how we will proceed in in that regard. Um, yeah, and I was very pleased to see Masachwa the categories, different categories A to J. Uh, again, on the mining side, it's 60% threshold or nothing. So my concern is just, does that serve as a disincentive? Because I know I can't make 60%, so why bother? Whereas, yeah, at least if I'm getting uh, a 10% or 20%, okay, that's where I am, I can move forward. So that that is refreshing. And I just wonder if that could, you know, hop across the fence and be applied to mining as well. But that's just a question I'm putting out there. Thank you. Thanks, Graal. Vistas, over to you. Thank you. I very much. I'm going to borrow from the Deputy Minister. Uh, we all know someone is unemployed. Uh, localization is going to get us to a point where the economy can start uh, having SMMEs and entrepreneurs and, and businesses that can uh, start producing the kind of jobs that we have and retaining the jobs that are already there will need all of us to buy from those businesses. You can run uh, the most sophisticated operation with the best systems and processes and controls and teams, but if no one walks through the door, mm -hmm. if no one places the order, defeats the purpose. So I think this takes us closer to getting to that point where purchasing decision makers know that uh, there's, there's something that will give them the assurance and certainty that they're buying from someone who produces their product locally and contributes uh, to that agenda of going the economy together. So, okay. Well, for me, I think we are making history. All right. Uh, others might not like what we are doing you know, by putting emphasis on, on local content and production. Uh, but we all know that you know, countries don't grow through imports only, you know, because we know that imports displace uh, companies and they create other challenges. And this government is not pursuing import replacement at all costs. Localization is the thing. It's a premier policy of the government uh, economic restructuring and recovery plan. We want to create opportunities in the value chain, as Dr. Pasun has said, uh, both locally and regional as well as uh, internationally. So the verification is critical of what uh, verification of what we are manufacturing in this country is critical for quality standard for certification mm -hmm. all right so let's pursue this we'll get the criticism our view is that we are learning in the process but we are also chattering the way forward so out there if people have comments suggestions on how we can come up with efficiencies when it comes to verification we are all welcome to send suggestions to the south african bureau of standards 
Thank you. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. I've got bad news for you. You are not off the hook yet. <laughs> there are still other questions from our viewers, and I'll be assisted by my colleague, Lungelo um, Utobangwano, in that regard. And thank you for having me on the session. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Katimo. For once, I thought that you were going to say Dr. Lungelo in the making. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that you are onto something. You are onto something, Chief. Um, colleagues, I, I take note that um, there are very interesting comments that are coming through the chat. However, we will not be doing justice if we were to just spend five minutes to answer those questions. So I want to propose the following. One is that um, the people who are posting all those comments, can they please leave their contact details or at least their names so that then we can check that on the list. And then we'll certainly make sure that those comments or questions are responded to. I've seen that some of my colleagues have started doing that already and thanks to those who have done that, but we just have to make sure that we respond to those questions adequately. But what I've also done was to summarize just the gist of what these questions are about before I can take the ones that are on team. One is with regards to the costs. And I think um, uh, all those ask those questions, any cost related questions, they should just await the, the CFO uh, and uh, so that she can be able to guide us. But I think from a marketing and a sales point of view, I will not be doing my job if I were to tell you that, I will not to tell you that there's always a combo. If you're an SABS client, over and above what the CFO is going to announce, if you're an SABS client, there's always that option to buy one and get, and get buy one and get one free. <laughs> so, so let's have a discussion. The second one is that there are questions with regards to capacity and efficiency. I would like Ms. Adwa or Katima to touch on that. But I just also want to advise that we are at the beginning of this journey. There might be some teething problems but we don't see them as problems. We see them as challenges that if we work together and collaborate, we can address those issues. Um, we need to really make a meaning to the word that says local is lacking. Otherwise then um, uh, it remains a statement or a concept, but it, it, the rest remains with us. So I'll, I'd like Ms. Ajo to touch briefly on that. Um, and then there is a list of products. Plus there's a question about whether under other entities who are accredited or who would like to participate in this can then be a part of the local content verification. In essence, does SABS or can SABS have a competitor? Uh, and the list of products. Uh, Dr. Mokuba, I'm going to put you on the spot on that one. Um, 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 want somebody to say that they don't want a politi political correct answer there. Uh, so just uh, the, the last one is that I think generally there's a question about uh, compliance or alignment of the scheme to the relevant sounds. I think the, the team that put together the stands took note of all the requirements, the regulations, the prevailing standards that are in that space. Mm -hmm. and, and as such, uh, we are striving to make sure that there is that convergence or alignment in that regard. However, Katima, you can answer one, answer one question. Uh, that question that says, how do we then align this local content scheme to the MAC scheme? And those are some of the, question, the, the questions. So in brief, it's just uh, three questions. Capacity and efficiency, Ms. Sajwa will touch on that. List of products and other entities, Dr. Makube can touch on that. And then uh, the alignment of this local planning scheme to the MAC scheme, uh, Katima can touch on that. And then, and then we can then move forward. Whilst we are getting ready, can we then take uh, the questions? I saw that Mario, you were the first one. Can you come through Mario, followed by Jan? Uh, Mario, can you unmute yourself? We can't, we can't, we can't hear you, Mario. Um, you are still mute. Can you unmute yourself, Mario? Okay. Mario is still gathering his thoughts. Can we then go to Jan? Uh, Jan, over to you. Unmute yourself.
Okay. Uh, Dr. Makube made reference to uh, uh, automation. And automation without the relevant skills remains a pipe dream. Uh, these are some of the challenges that we have. But having said that, uh, uh, Mario and Jan, can you please just write your questions on the chat? So then we can be able to capture them and then and then respond accordingly. I'm muting. OK. Uh, uh, yes, Jan, go for it. Your panel and uh, chairperson, thank you very much. My name is Jan van der Berg. I have one question. Um, if a company is audited by the SABS, will they automatically be introduced into the uh, uh, proudly South African or how will the system or the scheme then address that question? Thank you. OK, thanks. Can I then um, to Katim? Um, okay, register that question, Katim. Let me take uh, Mario. Mario. Mario is still on mute. Dr. Um, Makube, let me start with you. List of products. How can those be made? And know which one. Then also, um, can the SABS be given charge? I know this question might be futuristic. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, computers in this space, what is your view? Take it from you. Well, on the list of products, um, if people can visit the DTIC website, um, you should be able to find the the list of products, and also the National Treasury. Um, the office of the chief procurement officer. Um, you'll be able to find the instruction notes for all um, designated uh, products. All right. So yeah, it's either go to the DTI's website and and or the national treasure. So that we have about 28 uh, products which have been designated. Uh, including sub components. So if you download the instruction notes, you should be able to then read what is required uh, and the level of threshold in terms of uh, local manufacturing within the borders of, of, of South Africa. Well, the other issue around competition, um, I don't think I'm better suited you know, to answer that because, uh, look, government, when we decided to grant the South African Bureau of Standards this function was because it's a, an organ of state which is having the technical know-how to verify uh, many products in the country. And it's also an entity reporting to the DTIC. So a political decision was taken that, um, you know, given that it's a state entity, there are no costs uh, for the government to give this function to the SAPS. A decision was taken that it be an entity responsible for the verification. Well, the competition has many variables, colleagues. There's, there's also a cost into this. We can create competition, but the main question is who is going to pay for the verification? That must be resolved. So currently, how we are funding it is that there are fiscal transfers from the DTIC to the South African Bureau of Standards to carry this function because it's not for free. You know, you have to uh, verify different tiers of, 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 of suppliers. Um, there is technical verification. There is also financial verification. Remember, some of the products have a minimum threshold of less than 100%, meaning that there are components that can be imported into South Africa. So they must be verified, all right? Because government is not buying components, it's buying a final product, all right? So that needs to be done. And we have had a challenge in terms of some of the bidders 
not willing to pay for verification. All right. So uh, because this is it's not clearly funded in terms of the procurement uh, legislation. So that is why we as the department have taken a decision that to give momentum into the process of verification will make fiscal transfers to that. So if we talk about competition, let's consider that uh, we have to legislate it, you know, uh, moving forward. But this does not necessarily mean that the South African Bureau of Standards cannot work with industry associations, all right? We have had engagements with uh, various um, uh, industry associations in the valves and the pubs. I know that there are developments also in the steel industry as part of implementing the master plan in the steel. There are discussions on how can the industry play a role in making sure that you know there is compliance in the procurement of locally manufactured steel. Um, there is a structure being put in place and for me there is an opportunity for both that structure and the Bureau of Standards including part of South Africa to work together in making sure that we increase productivity in South Africa. So this is not about creating multiple verification agencies for the sake of creating competition per se. Remember, we are resolving an economic challenge of high import leakage, of slow growth and unemployment. So any initiative that will uh, impact positively on that as government we will be prepared to engage further. But we are not um, really going to, you know, create uh, competition for the sake of creating of having multiple agencies. There are genuine uh, issues on the cost of verification um, and we have said uh, you know the Bureau of Standards must negotiate with whoever that um, you know is willing to be verified you know let there be engagement on 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 the costs you know um, so we are looking at that but as the government we have the responsibility also to make sure that the cost of verification does not necessarily discourage you know people from entering into the space mm -hmm. of local um, um, uh, manufacturing so we see verification as an enabler for 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 local manufacturing and development yeah. thank you thanks a lot katima uh, alignment to the maximum um, Thanks, uh, I thought I was off the hook. <laughs> I'm back again at it. Um, let me start with the question in relation to if you are sub-certified from a product certification perspective, automatically can you have a proudly as a recognition? Let me put it that way. Because I think it's a good point that has been raised. And I think between SAPs and proudly as a, something we have to have have a look at, see how we can really look into this issue as part of the MOU that is in the works to say how we can have this cross-pollination uh, of, of the shared customers, so to, so to speak. So I think it's a, it's a good question, certainly noted. It's something that we'll really pay attention to. The, the second aspect on the alignment of product certification and local content, I think this is equally a good question, and it's something that we have reflected on uh, from a SAP's perspective. The intention really is if the two can be combined as a potential of also further reducing the costs of either rendering the product certification inclusive of the local content verification. What do I mean? Practically, when we certify uh, most of our clients on a product certification perspective, we deal with aspects of raw materials. There's a bomb, the bill of materials that being reviewed when we certify all of these issues. So there are a lot of similarities in certain instances. And how do we then make sure that we can have, if you like, joint audits 
so to speak. And by so doing, that should be able to minimize uh, the cost. I think once we're ready to do that, we've started that conversation internally. It's making sure that the auditors that are also certifying uh, these companies, auditing these companies in the product certification uh, from a competency perspective, uh, equally comfortable to also uh, perform that type of verification. So it's work in progress, and I think we're not far off for us to be able to do this in the near future. Thank you. Uh, program director, the issue around capacity. Uh, first, firstly, let me just say that, you know, the issue of capacity obviously will be addressed as and when the we, we, we see the developments. You know, currently what we've done is to look at a hybrid model. In the, we talk about technical uh, verification officers. Uh, throughout the SABS, we've got auditors who are responsible for Mark scheme. What we've done is to capacitate them to be part of the local content verification. So we've actually brought all those resources to actually the auditors who are part of the Mark scheme and the engineers who are employed in the laboratory services who are also part of the verification scheme. In terms of the financial auditors, what we've done is to bring in a total of 12 accounting firms who are part of the verification process who are supporting the SABS from uh, doing the verification. But um, like I said, you know, as we progress, as we um, the, the the scheme matures, we'll look at that and see whether this hybrid model that we put in place needs to be looked into or whatever whatever arrangement that uh, at, 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 at that given time will be suitable for uh, to ensure that there's sufficient capacity to conduct verifications. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks to all the comments and the responses to the comments. Uh, I'm going to take the second round, and which is the last one before we close. Um, I'm going to attempt to take the last three questions that were raised in our chat. I think the first one was from Desmond in terms of saying that um, can he partner with the SABS to develop the 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 the, the the pilot to automate the process. The simple answer, uh, Desmond, is that we are open to collaboration at any given time, but uh, please be mindful that we are uh, uh, governed by the PFMA and the National Treasury Regulations in terms of the collaborations that we have. So um, at, at an opportune time when that process uh, takes place, be on the lookout because it's most likely that we're going to go through a bidding process to make sure that uh, that that we get is competitive and is fair, is transparent. So be on the lookout for that. Um, the, the the second one is uh, with regards to the support in the clothing sector. Um, and, and that question was directed to SABS and DTI. It's quite a lengthy one. I will then request that um, our colleague, um, uh, um, Tumisani Mgadi, will then be in contact with Ngate Zuma just to make sure that we unpack that as part of the sector engagements that we do. And I've said that I don't want us to brush and rush these questions because there's value in the, in the questions that are being asked and we just need to understand the context and then we can respond accordingly. I think now um, I'm just gonna give the colleagues that are on the room, if they want to ask any particular question, um, uh, is there anybody who wants to ask any particular question? I don't want to leave them outside. Okay, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this um, uh, session. Or oh, Zunaid, uh, you've, you've got a you've got a hand there. Can you come through, Zunaid, uh, before before uh, I can allow Tina to close? Thank you, Program Director. Uh, I've just posted it in the uh, in the chat, but I'm just going to read it that uh, certain steel components. Uh, can you, we can't hear you, Zunaid. Can you just type your question? Noted. Uh, I have typed it. Oh, you have typed it. Oh, but but you're audible now. Okay, go for it. Okay. Uh, certain steel components for construction, uh, particularly in the geotechnical space, uh, such as sheet piles or self-drilling uh, hollow anchors, are, are not manufactured locally. 
but the local content threshold is 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 one hundred percent for for that uh, for that sector. So it, it would require some sort of exemption from DDIC. Is 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 this the responsibility of the client, or is it the responsibility of the contractor that's appointed to do the works? Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sunaid. Uh, if you have um, put your question on the, the chat, uh, Mesajwa, uh, working together with the teams internally, uh, will respond to that. I don't know whether Dr. Makube, do you want to to, to, to respond to it? Okay, go for it. There is a section dealing with the exemption process. So the process uh, is such that bidders must apply for an exemption prior to the closure of the tender. Right. So if the product is not available in the country, the DTIC is required to grant an exemption. But please make sure that you request for that exemption uh, prior to the closure of the tender. Our turnaround time is five working days. Don't send a request today on a tender that is closing tomorrow. We are not going to get a response. Please give us time. Five working days. Uh, yeah, and we will grant um, that exemption depending on whether the product is available or not. Thanks, Dr. Makube. I see that I've got Vusi in France. Uh, Vusi, go for it. Uh, good day, everyone. Yeah. Good day, everyone. I just wanted to confirm um, the self designation of products mainly by the SOE. If the SOE are aware of local manufacturers that are able to meet uh, their technical specifications and quality specifications, is the responsibility with the SOE or is the responsibility with uh, the entity that manufactures to engage with the DTI for their uh, products to be designated? That is my question. Uh, thanks, Vusi. Uh, Dr. Makube, you're not running away there. Uh, um... I hope you've captured that one. Let me take France. France, come through. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Mine actually ties in with Zunaid, and it's a problem we're facing at the coal phase by trying to tender out certain items. Is if, for example, if we look at sheet piles that, that aren't manufactured in South Africa, and we specify them in a temporary scenario. So, for example, we're doing trench shoring, and we installing sheet piles, excavating to the, the invert level to install the pipe, install the pipe, and then um, backfill and extract the sheet piles. Should should the municipality still apply for local contact exemption, ex, um, although that component of work is temporary and not permanent in nature? Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Franz. Um, Dr. Makube, can you? Uh, respond to those two questions, and then uh, we will come to the end of the questions and answers session. No, well, let, let me start with France. I mean, some of the, the questions are technical, you know, uh, because we have designated uh, steel for construction materials, all right, or construction works. So there are different types of steel, you know, and I, I won't be in a position to be specific in in my response so i'm requesting that you you contact the dtic there is a sector desk uh, dealing with steel uh, materials we should be able to provide you with a written response but procedurally it should be the bidder who must apply for an exemption because the bidder is the one who's responding to the tender and submitting the document so the exemption letter from the DTIC must be attached to your bidding uh, document. Don't uh, go ahead and declare on your own uh, without following the procedure. Follow the procedure as required by the instruction note. So please send the request or um, any query regarding that to the DTIC. Should be able to advise you. 
on the guideline for for um, self designation. So we have many commodities that are being procured by the government, right? and we have only designated about 28 of them. So there is a lot that is being procured without requirement for for local uh, production. And I can say that the appetite to buy imported products is very high in 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 in, in South Africa. So I receive calls, you know, whether is a particular product designated or not. But people expect me to say no, it's not designated. So it means that you can buy imported products, even though they are local manufacturers in the country. So that clause has been put in there to make it possible for organs of state to procure local and non-designated products. Right? So we have 28, but there's a lot that is not designated. So over the years, we have worked on the guidelines on how to invoke Regulation 8.4. In simple terms, the organ of state can invoke regulation 8.4 on non-designated products on condition that both the DTIC and the National Treasury are approached for an approval. All right. There are certain instances where we are currently doing research or designation studies on certain products which are not yet designated. And an organ of state will be in the market to procure that product. So it will be easier for us to say, yes, we can go ahead and invoke regulation 8.4. But there are other products which the DTIC is not necessarily looking at, but the procuring entity, especially SOEs or SOCs, will then approach the DTIC that they are buying a particular product and their, their manufacturers in the country. Can we then give them an approval? So we have developed that guideline. Go to the National Treasury website under the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer. You should be able to download a gui the guideline on Regulation 8.4, which is the local procurement of non-designated uh, sectors. We have developed that guideline because Local procurement means different things to different entities out there. You know that when it comes to construction uh, projects, there are allegations that in certain municipalities, they will then argue that the tender should be given to people residing in a particular municipality because that is local con that is local procurement for us that's not how it should be done it must be constitutional it must be lawful so the guideline is very clear local content is measured on the product which is manufactured within the borders of south africa not in a particular municipality so we have developed that guideline so that we we don't confuse the the procuring entities as well as the bidders. So in yeah, in essence, there is a guideline. Please go and download it. Very clear on how uh, that can be invoked and the procedure to be followed. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Makube. If there are any participants who still have further questions and uh, they they want to understand what does the process entail, they can send their uh, queries to info at sabs.co.za. It's info at sabs.co.za. It will then be channeled to the respective functions within the organization and then responded to accordingly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the, the session, but uh, um, we would like um, Tina to, to close off. After Tina's uh, speech, then the session will be adjourned. And uh, on behalf of my fellow uh, program director here, the, the team that has put together, the management team, and all the participants, we just want to thank you. And then after Tina's uh, 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 speech, 
then the session will be adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good day and thank you to everyone who has made the time to join us, either physically or virtually, today. A very special thank you to the Honorable Deputy Minister Majola, our esteemed panelists, Dr. Taboko Makube, Mr. Eustace Mashumbe, Mr. Grant Mandasi, Dr. Sadvir Basun, Ms. Jody Skolz, as well as the other SABS colleagues who participated today. We really appreciate your time, support, and valuable contribution into the development of this scheme and your insights today. We surely have had a jam-packed morning, colleagues. We started off today with the Honorable Minister opening the, the session, as well as launching the local content verification scheme. We then moved on to Musachwa, who dealt with the di dynamics of the scheme. We then moved on to the challenges and opportunities relating to public proc procurement and local content verification, as well as the view on the evolution of the scheme by Dr. Taboko. We heard from Proudly SA and the role they play in localization, partnership opportunities, and the enforcement of local content in the country. We have been privileged to hear firsthand how Maltotech has used the local content certificates and how successful collaboration was achieved with the suppliers. Further to this, we heard about the Made in Africa initiative and the importance of regional standardization in support of the AFCFTA, as well as the opportunities and challenges in successfully implementing the AFCFTA. Thank you colleagues, uh, to the, all the colleagues online for the engaging questions. We endeavor to ensure, or we endeavor to get back to you on those questions as soon as possible if they haven't been responded to already. To summarize this morning's session, this local content verification scheme is intended to drive localization through verification of designated products in critical areas of our economy in an efficient and globally competitive manner and act as a catalyst in achieving the country's industrial, economic, and developmental objectives. The strategic focus on localization, as demonstrated by legal, uh, the recent local content designation of cement, will aid in protecting the South African economy and lead, lead to job creation, which is imperative in reducing poverty. The local content scheme presents an exciting opportunity for the SABS, as well as the entire South African industry. Industry will be able to use the fact that their products are independently verified to have been manufactured locally to increase their market share. The scheme will encourage local industry to give preference to locally produced components when making procurement decisions and therefore encourage innovation and industrialization. Successful implementation of the scheme has the potential to garner the support for local industries and in particular SMMEs. The scheme also pro provides opportunities for international OEMs who want to set up business in our country. This enables them to buy components from local manufacturers. This would boost the local content of their products and therefore improve their chances of accessing the market. The initiative will also encourage the much needed collaboration amongst the industry players to further improve innovation and industrialization. The local content verification scheme is one that allows for products to be verified upfront and certified for compliance with local content requirements. It provides procurers with some confidence upfront in their decision making on their procurement processes to only consider certified products. The scheme can benefit both the public and private sector in their procurement activities across a wide variety of sectors. In addition, the local content scheme envisages the linking of products to unique product identification codes to ensure that local procuring citizens can link directly the local content results. Products verified for local content are on a grading system pending the outcome of the verification, which allows for various levels of compliance. The intention of the scheme is not to burden manufacturers with additional costs or place burden on SMMEs. The SABS remains committed to ensuring the scheme remains as cost effective as possible and colleagues, as Lungelo alluded to earlier, we will be offering the scheme at a significantly reduced rate for the next year. So please take advantage of that offer. As the Honorable Deputy Minister stated in his opening address, the SABS is ready, and we are indeed ready. Thank you to each one of you for your participation today, and we look forward to engaging with you soon. Take care. Thank you.